Um, thank you, everyone. Hello. Uh, I'm going to be speaking today about COVID-19 vaccine boosters, and here are my conflicts of interest. Amazingly, it's been almost two years since we've started to give these COVID vaccines, um, and since that time, we've given almost 13 billion doses. This is a graph um, that is showing the share of people who have received at least one dose of a COVID-19 vaccine. And I'm really showing it because I'm giving a talk about boosters, but the reality is that only applies to middle income and higher income countries because uh, less than 30% of individuals in low income countries have actually received even the primary series. The COVID-19 vaccine type that people have received really varies from country to country. Here in the US, most people have gotten mRNA, but actually most people in the world have gotten um, non-mRNA vaccines, primarily inactivated vaccines and uh, adenovirus vector-based vaccines like AstraZeneca. And before I talk about boosters, I want to just emphasize how well our primary series has done over this period of time. So COVID vaccines, that primary series is estimated to have prevented up to 20 million deaths globally in that first year. Most of those deaths were prevented in the countries that got the vaccine, of course, um, so middle income and high income countries, very significant um, protection. But besides access to these vaccines, the major hurdle that we faced is SARS-CoV-2 evolution. So our COVID vaccines were tested during 2020. And in that period of time on this figure, which is showing the proportion of variants over time, uh, really we had circulating the original strain, which was a perfect match to the vaccine. And that's when we saw such great results, like 90 plus percent efficacy against symptomatic um, disease. However, when the vaccine started to roll out, it was a very different um, outbreak or pandemic. And we saw at first alpha, then much more significantly delta, which was starting to evade our immune responses. And then the last nine months or so, we've been having different subvariants of Omicron. Now we're facing BA5. In those first months of Omicron, um, it was very clear that neutralizing antibody responses elicited by our primary vaccines were not as effective against the Omicron variant. Um, this is a paper from some of my colleagues in January that showed loss of neutralizing activity against Omicron in particular um, in individuals who either received Pfizer or Ad26 J and J. Either way, they were losing um, immunity against Omicron, and that was translated to an increase in cases. So on the left are <clears throat> average daily cases over time. And in particular, I want you to look at um, the dark line, which is in unvaccinated individuals, and the light line, which is in that time fully vaccinated, so two vaccines with mRNA. And for a period of time, those lines almost started to converge, meaning that vaccine protection against any kind of infection was really, really <clears throat> waned a lot, <clears throat> almost lost completely. Um, but they never fully overlapped. They're always maintained some protection against infection. But what was really, really prominent and important was that there was persistent protection um, against deaths, severe outcomes and deaths. And that's shown on the right, looking at average daily deaths over time. And at the peak of the first Omicron surge, um, the unvaccinated death rate was 10 times as high as those that had received the vaccine. And that benefit still persists so that even today we're dealing with BA5, which is very far from the original strain, um, unvaccinated individuals have six times um, the death rate as those who have had the primary series. Um, this is some estimates that are looking at that preserved effectiveness against severe disease. This is in the United States where <clears throat> the investigators estimated that the vaccines have prevented 2.3 million deaths and that that protection um, continued across the Omicron wave. So this is to just reinforce the point that the primary series, these two doses, most of the time two doses, um, had persistent protection against severe outcomes even through the original Omicron wave. So you may ask, okay, all right, then why are we talking about boosting? What, what's the benefit? So I'm gonna go through the data to support why there is a benefit um, to boosting, starting with the benefit of the first vaccine. Um, so in the laboratory, if you looked at individuals who'd received an mRNA bo uh, boost, whether they'd gotten mRNA first or even add 26 first, in any of these scenarios, 
um, boosting greatly in, uh, increased neutralizing activity against Omicron. And this was actually very surprising because if you recall, these boosts do not match Omicron. They're still the original strain, but still boosting, even if it was with a mismatched vaccine, you still had an increase in Omicron specific, BA1 specific immune responses. And this ended up translating to real world vaccine effectiveness. And this is data from Qatar. Uh, this is in the early spring that looked at, uh, looked at symptomatic Omicron infection and showed that whether you're talking about Moderna or you're talking about Pfizer, adding that third mRNA dose significantly improved your vaccine effectiveness. And this was really apparent with severe outcomes. So yes, the primary series still had a lot of protection against severe outcomes compared to not being vaccinated at all, but you could still do better. So if you added that third shot, really sometimes doubled your protection against severe outcomes. And this is a figure I made just kind of putting together roughly a lot of different data from other studies that shows across the board how boosting improves your protection against severe outcomes. And one question that people may ask is, okay, well, does that translate even to teenagers, like young people? Um, and the answer is yes. Now, teenagers don't have as many severe outcomes, thank goodness as older folks do, but they sometimes do. And this is a figure, I want you to really look at the yellow dots, which is Omicron specific um, infections, <clears throat> where there's a waning of protection with the primary series against um, admissions to emergency room or urgent care for Omicron. And that really seems to come down over six months. But then for those that got that boost, on the far right, you see an improvement back to about an 80% um, effectiveness against ER visits with Omicron. So this is a benefit you can see even in younger people. Well, what about boosting in the context of hybrid immunity? Because most people around the world have been infected already at least once. So what's the benefit of boosting in that scenario? So first, we do know that previous infection, of course, like this is not surprising, confers some benefit um, and <clears throat> reduces your risk of um, new infections. And in particular, this figure is showing new infections with BA5. And really what matters here is, you know, how recently you were infected and how closely you were infected with the current circulating strain. So if you were infected with the Wuhan strain back in 2020, you know, you have about 50% residual protection against infection. But if you were infected with BA2 just a couple months ago, you have much better protection against BA5, so 75%. So this is just showing that previous infection does provide protection, but it's not all one thing, right? The further you are from that infection, you know, the lower your protection. And certainly if it's with a really different strain, that's also lower. But what about when you put it all together with vaccination as well? Um, and so this is a study that was looking at the impact of previous infection, previous infection plus two doses and then three doses. On the left here is previous, uh, excuse me, symptomatic BA2 infection. And on the right is for severe critical outcomes. And what I've outlined here in the red boxes that I really want you to see is that if you've had two doses of a vaccine and a previous infection, your protection either against symptomatic illness or severe outcomes is about the same as if you've had a third dose. So there's no doubt that hybrid immunity definitely confers a good, a big benefit. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so this kind of leads actually to the question, okay, doc, like why would I get a third dose? You know, I've had two doses and I've been vaccinated, I've been infected you know, what's the benefit? And the benefit is really, if you look at the right side of these, which is to say, you can do even better. So if you have three doses of vaccine and a previous infection, you can really bump up your effectiveness against your protection, against both symptomatic illness and against severe outcomes up to 100% protection. If you've had a uh, previous infection and you get the three vaccines. Timing may be important, though, um, in, in the context of a previous infection. Um, and what I want you to look at with this figure, this was a study where they looked at um, antibody boosting for those who'd been uninfected, never infected, and those that had a previous infection. In this case, Delta uh, before boosting, so it was just a couple of months. And I really want to draw your eye to the blue dots because those are people who had been pretty recently infected at baseline, they have pretty high titers already relative to the other groups that were studied. So when they got the boost and you looked at 60 days post-boost, 
It wasn't like a tremendous change. And what I really want to show there and point out is that, you know, if you have high, really high immune responses already, I mean, it's possible that the boost is kind of wasted on you because you already have high responses. And there may even be a scenario where you may not even really respond to that boost because your, your antibody responses are so high. So there may be a benefit uh, to waiting a little bit before getting that really important additional boost, you know, maybe two months, maybe three months. Um, for your immune system to rest um, and, you know, for you to have the best benefit from that boost. You can ask the question, I mean, does it matter what I got for my primary series? I mean, most people around the world did not get mRNA. So are they, you know, out of luck? And the answer is no, you can, any vaccine can be boosted. This is a study that looked at a whole different, different cohorts of people that either got mRNA first, Novavax, which is protein, AstraZeneca, which is the adenovirus vector or inactivated vaccine. And no matter what it was that you got first, if you got a boost, in this case, mostly mRNA, you had pretty equivalent immune responses. They all did great. Uh, so no matter what you get, originally you can get boosted. Uh, this I wanna highlight in particular, that this is true for the inactivated vaccine, um, which is more than half of people in the world have received an ina inactivated vaccine. This is data from the Dominican Republic that showed that uh, CoronaVac plus an mRNA, you had a nice response to your ancestral strain, um, the original strain, and you also had an increase in your Omicron specific immune responses. Similarly with J&J, &J, if you've had a single dose of J&J &J and you got boosted, you got a little bit of an effect if you got that second dose of J&J, &J, and then if you got a second dose with mRNA or uh, with mRNA, you got to immune responses or vaccine effectiveness that was equivalent to three shots of mRNA. Now, does it matter what vaccine you get as the boost? And we don't have great data about this. This is data from 2021, looking in the context of the original strain um, at what <clears throat> uh, different co cohorts of people. Um, in this case, these are people who had been gotten the primary vaccine series with Pfizer, and then got all these different boosts and they were compared. And the first major observation I'd like to show is that no matter what boost you got, whether it was AstraZeneca or Novavax, you had a boost in your immune responses. And you can see that on the right, they all had um, an increase in immune responses that favored getting vaccination. Um, and in this small series, which was um, looking at short-term responses, mRNA seemed to outperform the others. So both Pfizer and Moderna have the highest increase. And I point this out to say that in this, it looks like, okay, maybe mRNA outperforms these others. But this is in a short-term study and with the original strain. So I don't think for sure we know that. And durability is a really big issue. Um, some of my colleagues here at Beth Israel Deaconess did a study where they looked at durability of immune responses for individuals who'd been uh, vaccinated with no, um, Pfizer for the primary series, and then boosted, in this case, either with AD26, which is J&J, &J, or Pfizer. And initially, all the groups had like a nice boost in responses right away, mRNA probably a tiny bit more. And then, um, however, what was really important that they wanted to show is that at four weeks, the immune responses after mRNA boost really waned. Whereas those that got the heterologous, meaning different, they got Pfizer and then at 26, they had a persistence and durability of their immune response that was better. Now, whether that's because it was at 26 or because it was just two different types of vaccines remains to be seen. This was seen also for durable immunity um, with T cells in your cellular immune compartment, which we think is very critical for protection against severe disease. So durability is an issue, as I mentioned. Um, this is looking at vaccine effectiveness against symptomatic Omicron infection over time. On the left is showing previous infection, which is really interesting to show that there's <clears throat> more durable immunity with previous infection. You can see this uh, maintenance of protection um, above 50% for even about a year. Um, and you compare that to what you see with two doses of the vaccine which after six months, you see a real waning of protection. <clears throat> this is against Omicron. And then on the right are three doses. And this is only a month later, you still start to see a bit of a drop of vaccine effectiveness. This is some data that the CDC showed at their recent meeting 
where they looked at three doses versus two against symptomatic BA5 infection, which is most relevant these days. Um, and so in the first few months after you get that third dose, you get a big bump, as we saw, like 50% increase in your protection. But really after like three months or so, it looks like your three doses starts to look again like two doses. So you get this short-term burst of protection, and then after three months or so, that starts to come down. Now, this is only after symptomatic infection, so probably protection against severe outcomes is going to last longer, but there's still this question of durability. So that raises, you know, this like, okay, what about benefit of boosting again? Um, you know, why are we seeing that everywhere, and why is that being recommended? So I'm going to go through a little bit of the data that shows <clears throat> what happens when you get two boosts. This was tried first in Israel, where they started to see after the BA1 surge of Omicron, you know, you started to have BA2 and then BA4, 5. So they really said, okay, what's going on with our most vulnerable people, 60 years and older? And they started to roll out this fourth mRNA dose, this second boost. Um, and in this paper on the left is PCR confirmed infection, could include asymptomatic infection, and on the right is uh, hospitalization. They also have other outcomes, but I'm just showing these two. And the blue line is the control group, which in this case is the three dose group. And then the yellow orange line is the four dose group. So when you see these lines separate, you're really seeing the additional benefit of the fourth dose. Um, and in the case of hospitalization, that's a 72% um, vaccine effectiveness for that fourth dose. But I do wanna draw your eye to the X axis where there's only 28 days of follow-up. So what we're really talking about here is a benefit we really only know about in the short term. In Sweden, they also observed this benefit of the fourth dose. <clears throat> this was cuts in short-term risk of death in really, really frail, vulnerable people in a long-term care facility. And on the right is looking at you know, the most vulnerable people, 80 years and older who are in this long-term care facility. And you see a big separation between those that, uh, this is in their cumulative mortality, between the third dose group and the fourth dose group. So in that first two months, you had a boost of vaccine effectiveness of about 71%. After the first few months, you know, then you don't see as much of a benefit. But clearly, if you're working in this long-term care facility, you're thinking adding that fourth dose is gonna reduce the mortality, particularly among people who are 80 years and older. Well, what about bivalent vaccination? What does that even mean? So bivalent means really two different strains. So in this case, the original strain plus the Omicron strain. <clears throat> and we know from kind of natural history that being exposed to Omicron plus original strain does create some improved cross neutralization. So on the left are individuals who've been triple vaccinated and there they have immune responses um, that are great against wild type, uh, decent against BA2, and then kind of fallen off for BA4 and 5. Those that have been triple vaccinated and had a prior BA2 infection, so bivalent, right? Vaccinated with the original strain, exposed to the new strain. There they have improved responses, both against BA2, which makes sense, but also BA4 and 5. So this is a hint that maybe being exposed to both of these increases your cross neutralization. And Moderna presented data at ACIP of their bivalent vaccine that showed some of this. So this is in actual human beings where they looked at an Omicron bivalent Moderna vaccine. And on the light blue is the original vaccine and the dark blue is the bivalent. All of both of these vaccines elicited a nice boost of, of responses against BA4 and 5. Um, but always, no matter what, at what group they looked at, the bivalent was a little bit better. And then when they looked at their bivalent BA5 vaccine, and here we're only looking at mice because that's the only data that they presented, uh, there was an improvement in this case with um, the first booster and against BA4-5 viral challenge, particularly in the lung. So very preliminary data, but showing all of this is adding up to say that the bivalent vaccines, especially including that Omicron, uh, improves outcomes. And in this case, it's with mice. And then here's the Pfizer data they presented, um, also looking at mice, um, showing that the BA5 bivalent vaccine um, improved neutralizing antibody titers compared to the monovalent vaccines. 
So this gets us to the heart of current booster recommendations. And it's really, in my opinion, um, you know, why is it that, for example, the CDC is recommending that everyone gets boosted now? And I think it's because of a concern for older populations um, for late 2022 and early 2023. And this is a figure showing new hospital admissions of patients with confirmed COVID-19 by age. And I'm showing you here that among those who are 70 years and older, there's been an uptick, pretty significant uptick in new hospital admissions recently. And that's borne out with uh, looking at the death rates by vaccination status, <clears throat> whether they've gotten first and second booster doses among people ages 50 years and older. And if you've had two boosts, you have a 14 times lower risk of death compared to unvaccinated and a three times lower risk of death compared to those who received one dose. And even though we're talking about two doses here, the reality is that most people have not even had a first dose. This is in the United States. Uh, most people across the board have not received a first booster, but most importantly in the population of people who are over 65, nearly 30% of them have not received their first booster dose. And so that's a concern when you start to see this uptick in deaths in that cohort. So to finish up, uh, COVID-19 vaccine primary series has saved up to 20 million lives, but protection against severe disease may finally be waning after more than 18 months. A vaccine boost increases protection against all COVID-19 outcomes. Any vaccine can be boosted and any vaccine can be a boost, though mRNA may be superior in the short term. Mix and match vaccine strategies may improve duration and breadth of responses. I think we need more data on this. Um, and prior infection confers definitely an additional benefit um, and boosting immediately after infection may be less useful. So you may wanna wait a couple of months um, after a recent infection. And finally, a second vaccine boost rescues waiting protection of the first boost um, and a bivalent vaccine may improve protection even more. So thank you very much. I appreciate your time.